past few weeks, we've considered a number of nations and areas of, of, the, of the world and how they are referred to in Bible prophecy. And this evening we come to consider a perhaps a nation that's a little closer to home as far as we are concerned. And as we'll see, it's actually very close to home. Um, some of the considerations of this evening will have uh, show us where Australia is actually affected by these things. But I wish, first of all, friends, to put this in a little bit of perspective. Because why did God give us all these prophecies? He did not give it to us to satisfy our idle curiosity. Though we might look around and say, isn't that amazing? I know what's going to happen. So we can know what's going, going to happen and, and say, and, and, and our ego takes an ego trip because we can tell people what's going to happen. That's not why God gave it. He gave it, friends, to assist faithful believers to act in faith. Because God gave these prophecies to warn people of what was coming upon the earth and gave them an opportunity, therefore, to do something about it. Because, friends, what these prophecies, these nations that we've considered, they have a, a, a very similar theme, don't they? Armageddon is coming. A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. How can we be saved out of it? Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, Almighty God, in instructing the Hebrews who were about to face a similar destruction at the hands of the Romans, Almighty God said, go back and have a look what Noah did. Okay? In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, we're told that by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. And that's what we've seen in the Bible as we've looked at these prophecies. Be warned of God of things not seen as yet. He moved with fear. And so, in other words, he heeded the warning. He acted upon it. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now something very interesting about that, because we don't have time to go to the, the epistles of Peter, but in the epistles of Peter you will find that there's a parallel drawn. We're going we're gonna to touch on that parallel in a moment. But before we do so, there's other examples. We go to Mark chapter 13, and where the people of the first century were warned that when you see the abomination of desolations, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, or where he ought not, there's three parallel accounts which we need to bring into play here. There's Matthew 24, there's Mark 13, there's Luke 21. They all talk about the same thing. Let's... No, I'm just paraphrasing what he's saying. So when you see that abomination of desolation, he said to those first century believers, he says, then let them in which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And there were a portion of people who fled at that time. There was an opportunity to flee because the first siege was withdrawn because the emperor died and the chap that was besieging the city. He went off and became the emperor of Rome and another person ultimately destroyed the land, the, the city of Jerusalem. There was opportunity to flee. So they were warned of God of things not seen as yet and they did things to save themselves and their families. Now he said in, in, regarding Noah that, that Peter says... Uh, comments on these things and he says it's a like figure whereunto baptism doth now save us. So that warning of Noah is very significant for us. Because what of us? Well we need to be saved out of the destruction that's coming upon this earth. And we need to prepare because at that time the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to judge between the quick and the dead. He's going to grant immortality to those who are the faithful. Those who have identified with his saving name through baptism. 
And so we have the words of the apostle that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his apostles in Mark chapter 16. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. And as we said, that's a parallel or so Peter tells us in his epistles. And I can show you that, that location afterwards, if you like. It's a parallel with the things that Noah did. And that's the very reason they're given in Hebrews chapter 11. And so, friends, it's not for our idle curiosity. It's to warn us of things to come so we can do something about it. And that applies to all of us, no matter where we are in life. There are things we all need to do to prepare for that day. So let's, having given that very brief, not as brief as I hoped, introduction, let's turn to Britain. Now what we're going to see, friends, is that Britain is, is referred to in the Bible um, by use of their ancient name. They're referred to in biblical terms and they're alluded to without being directly named. And so we're going to see a number of occasions or some occasions where these things happen. But first I want to actually take you to um, um, the reading that we read in Ezekiel chapter 38. Because in Ezekiel chapter 38 we have two opposing forces. We have those forces mentioned from verse 2, led by a chap by the name of Gog, a word which means the one at the top, and he's of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. The word chief is the Hebrew word Rosh. It is a proper noun. It's the ancient name for Russia. The prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and with him in verse, uh, in, in verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia and Libya, Gomer in verse 6, and Tagama, and all, all their bands. And they're going to come down upon the mountains of Israel, and they're going to be opposed by another group of nations in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof. Now I'm going to suggest to you that in the Bible there are in fact two Tarshishes. Tarshishes. Okay? And the one that's being referred to here is particularly the Western Tarshish, but it will indeed involve the Eastern Tarshish. Because the Eastern Tarshish, I'm going to suggest to you, is a young lion. And you'll see why I say that shortly. And we're going to con con concern ourselves with the Western Tarshish of the Bible and not so much with the Eastern Tarshish. So we're going to ask the question of this. Let's have a look what the Bible says about the geographical location of this Western Tarshish. Well, we never read of Tarshish being reached by land. Now that's the first point which we need to ascertain. It's never, we never read of it being reached by land. Now that's not proof that it's an island, but it's a good indicator. In, in, in Psalm 72 and verse 10, it's associated with islands. A good indicator, it's an island. The, the kings of Tarshish... And of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. And so he's associated with the isles. In Jonah chapter 1 and verse 3, and we're going to have a look more closely at this in a moment, it is actually noted for being a faraway land because Jonah wanted to flee to Tarshish to get away from God, to go in the opposite direction to Nineveh, where God had told him to go to preach the gospel to the Assyrians. And the historian Herodotus tells us that this place, Tarshish, was beyond the pillars of Hercules, beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, outside the Mediterranean Sea, beyond that place where, back in ancient times, it was believed you fell off the world and were never seen again until a chap by the name of Christopher Columbus, I think that's the one, he, he went right round and found out that it didn't happen. All right? So that was what was believed. But these people, the Phoenicians, used to go out there and, and they came back. Now, let's turn our attention to Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1 to 3, where we're told that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, 
and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he wanted to get away from God, and he definitely didn't want to go to Nineveh. So he's going to go in the opposite direction. What did he do? Well, he, he went up to Joppa, which you can see on the map is actually virtually Tyre, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. Now, in the middle of the Mediterranean there, on the western shores of the land of Israel. And he's going to get on a ship to go to Tarshish. Now, he's clearly not going to India, is he? Because back in those days, when you headed down the bottom of Africa, you fell off the world and you were never seen again. That was what happened. All right? So where was he going? Well, he was going to a place called Tarshish, which was beyond the pillars of Hercules, beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, at the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. He wanted to get as far away from God and that as far as he was concerned, and that ancient world was as far as you could go. Somewhere where he could not be got at. And of course we know he never made it, did he? He ended up having to do his job. So that's the first point. Geographical location. The scriptures clearly indicate it's a faraway place. It was away to the west. It was out through the Mediterranean Sea. It was, going, it was uh, located by hopping on a ship. Well, let's have a look at the trading methods of Tarshish. Well, this is the western Tarshish, as I said earlier. And here's their trading methods. Well, in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 16, and there's other references which indicate this, they are a maritime power. And I'm going to suggest to you we're talking about Britain, and today they are still a maritime power. Not that long ago, there was a, a company, big company, that was very British, called the, du the British East India Company. All right? A trading maritime power. Perhaps we could say it's replaced by the Commonwealth of Nations. In Ezekiel chapter 27 and verse 12 and 25, they were an independent offshore trading nation and they traded in tin, which you can find in Cornwall. They traded in lead, you can find that in, in Yorkshire. They traded in iron, which you can find in Lincolnshire and Northamptonshire and, and other places. And we're going to look at these things as well. And they also traded in silver, and you can find all of those in Britain. In actual fact, not content to just make you believe me, here's a few pictures. All right? Here's the words of Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 27 and verse 12. Tarshish was thy, that is Tyre's, merchant. So people traded with Tyre, okay, this Tarshish nation traded with Tyre by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches with silver, iron, tin and lead they traded in thy fairs. So here's the list which he says they traded in and here's the tin mines. Well, some of the tin mines that are found in the land of, in, in, in Britain, okay, iron, here's an iron mine. In actual fact, in this particular iron mine, it tells us that the miners, over thousands of years, they followed the ore deep underground. That's the brochure that you get from the Clearview Caves. It's now an iron mining museum. And they tell us that they, that they mined in those caves for thousands of years. It doesn't have to be many thousand to be back to the times of Ezekiel. Silver. We could go to Wikipedia. Plenty of other encyclopedias tell us the same thing. Historically, extensive tin and, and copper mining occurred in Devon and Cornwall, as well as arsenic, silver, zinc, and many other metals. We're noting that one for the silver that is mentioned there, which is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 27. Well, perhaps we can ask the question, well, where does the name Britain come from? Well, in Recyclopedia, um, we're told that in Syri the Syriac language, Baratanic or Baratanic signifies land of tin from which the name Britain is supposed to be derived. So these are all suggesting, friends, that this area of this Tarshish that's been spoken of in Ezekiel, as we've seen it in Ezekiel chapter 38, 
is, in fact, written. When we turn our attention to Ezekiel chapter 38, we see that Britain has a particular special relationship amongst the nations of the world with Israel. And here in Ezekiel chapter 38, Russia comes down this group of nations. Just interestingly, um, you might have noticed that this group of nations in verse 4 was told as, of a, as a company. In verse 7, a company or an assembly. If you consult the Septuagint translation of the Bible, this is a religious word. It's a synagogue. So it's a religious term. So this group of nations is actually gathered together, Russia and all the nations that are with them, on religious terms. Now, that's quite interesting what's happening with Russia and Europe and all these other nations. It's religious agreement. It's religious. It's religion is very much at the basis of why they're being brought together. And so, on one side, you've got Russia and all those nations with them. On the other side, you've got Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions thereof. And they're supporting Israel as Russia comes against them. Okay? And so Tarshish is amongst those countries. They are supporters of Israel. And historically, that has indeed been the case. And... Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 9 tells us that, that amongst other passages, and we're going to look at that very shortly, tells us that they'll be among the first to bring God's people Israel back into the land of Israel. Now that's really significant, friends, because we live in a period of time in which that has begun to happen. And that's what we're told would happen. Now, I'm going to take you to a quote made by a Christadelphian in 1853. Not 1953, 1853, based on his understanding of these two passages of Isaiah 60 and verse 9 and Isaiah 43 and verse 3. Now here is an occasion in Isaiah 60 where Tarshish is mentioned. In Isaiah 43, there's no mention of Tarshish, but I'm going to show you why it's talking about Tarshish. So... The Christadelphian by the name of John Thomas, he, he made this point in, in, in 1853. He said, there can be no doubt to the fact that this country, that is Britain, will open a way for the despised and persecuted race of Abraham to stand once more in their fatherland. Now, let's remember at that time, Jews didn't live in the land of Israel. There was no land of Israel as Palestine. And it was overrun by the Turks. The Ottoman Empire had control of that place. Now, that's all significant. We're going to see that in relation to Britain in a moment. So stand once more in their fatherland. Let's continue the quote. But first, the country, that is Britain, must seize a great amount of territory adjacent to the Holy Land. It will therefore be necessary to occupy Egypt, Ethiopia and Seba, besides other places, in order to make these a wall of defence for the Jewish colony. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that that Ethiopia, in the Hebrew, is the word Cush, and we're going to see that the, the word that, uh, in actual fact, the Cushites, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, Cushan Rishathaim was in the area out towards Iraq, and so the, the, the area of Iraq is actually the area of Cush. So where it says Ethiopia there, we can put the Hebrew Cush because that's what he's quoting Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 3. You see, he's quoting, he, he's referring us to two passages of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 9, which is actually a prophecy which awaits its full fulfilment. It's after the return of Christ that the full fulfilment of that passage is going to take place. We're going to see that at the end of our, of our lecture this evening. Um, from another passage of the Bible, okay, where it says, Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first. You notice isles and Tarshish associated again. To bring thy sons, that is God's sons, from far, from their, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord thy God, to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. Now, there, he's talking about bringing the children of Israel, the Jews, back to the land of Israel. And then God says, and in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 3, God, in a prophecy to the nation of Israel, he says, I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. 
I'm going to save you, Israel. He says, I gave Egypt for thy ransom and Ethiopia and Seba for thee. And God says, for you, as a price for your life, I'm going to give Egypt, Ethiopia and Seba. Well, let's look at this a little bit more closely. You see, in accordance with Bible prophecy, Britain gained control of Egypt in 1881 to 82 through until after the Jewish nation was formed, 1948, right through to 1956. They gained control of the area of Cush, that's the Hebrew word in Isaiah 43 and verse 3, the area of Iraq, from 1920 through to 1958. They gained control of the area of Seba or Sudan from 1898 to 1956. They were given this price for the life of the nation of Israel. And having given these territories, Britain then had the duty to begin the process of bringing the Jews back to the land of Israel. Now, how was this going to happen? We ask the question, how will, in actual fact, the first of those nations mentioned is our key? And our key, friends, is the fact that Britain was going to take control of Egypt. A foreign power was going to take control of Egypt. And that makes Egypt the king of the south from Daniel chapter 11. Let's turn our attention to Daniel chapter 11 and have a look very briefly at that passage which we've looked at a couple of times already in our last few lectures that we have considered. Well, not last one, but the one before and I think the one before that. You see, by taking control of Britain, of the area south of Israel, a foreign power in control of that area makes that power, according to the words of Daniel chapter 11, the king of the south. And we're going to just concern ourselves with one verse, or part of one verse, out of that, um, out of that chapter. We're told in verse 40, and in that time, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. Now what we mentioned in our, in our previous lecture on this subject was we, that we mentioned there that the him was the power that was in control previously of both north and south. It began as the Roman Empire, it, and, and it became the Ottoman Empire, which controlled both north and south. And at this point, Britain now took control of the area south of the land of Israel, of Egypt. And they therefore became the king of the south. And they pushed the ruler of Constantinople out of the Holy Land. And that's what we're being told would happen. And you can put beside that verse, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12, which talks about the drying up of the river Euphrates or the drying up of the Ottoman Empire, the Euphrates Empire. Now, when you have a river, you don't dry it up at its source. Although Britain, Australia, New Zealand and so forth tried to. It didn't work. In 1914... The Anzacs landed in Anzac Cove, monumental failure. The only success of that, of, of that venture was when they withdrew. They went down into the area of Egypt and they pushed the Turks out through the Holy Land. They dried up the Euphrates Empire from its extremities. Or the extremities that existed of that particular empire. And so there was that drying up, and, and, and it's very significant, those final words in Revelation chapter 16, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That's the way of the kings of the sun's rising. It's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ and his immortal saints. He's preparing for them to come. And that's been going on for a hundred years. We have a crisis in the Middle East that actually began with that event. And I can, I can show you how that's the case. In actual fact, the leader of ISIS has told us that that's the case. That's why there's a crisis in the Middle East. 
That's why ISIS is doing what he's doing, because of these events that took place a hundred years ago. Well, let's just very briefly summarise World War I. In World War I, leading up to World War I, many in Britain supported the formation of a homeland to the Jews. However, Turkey controlled the land. In 1914, war broke out in, in, in Europe between Britain with allies against, uh, um, with their allies against Germany, Austria, Hungary, and later that year, the Ottoman Empire. The war on the Western Front developed into a stalemate. You know what it was, from God's point of view? Use up resources so that we can get the real problem sorted out. Let's get the, the Ottoman Empire pushed out of the land of Israel. So one of the main proponents of a Jewish homeland in Palestine was a chap by the name of Chaim Wiseman. He's a leading spokesman for the organisation for organised Zionism in Britain. Wiseman was a chemist who had developed a process to synthesise acetone via fermentation. Acetone is required in the production of cordite, a powerful propellant explosive needed for, to fire ammunition without generating telltale smoke. It gave Britain a huge advantage in World War I. They owed him something. God put this man there. They owed him something. A shortage of cordite would have severely hampered Britain's effort. Lloyd George, then Minister for Munitions, was grateful to Wiseman and so supported his Zionist aspirations. You see what's happened? World War I comes, just happens that this Jew is able to produce gunpowder better than anyone else. And now Britain owes it to them. And so this led to the Balfour Declaration. Britain agreed to form a homeland for the Jews. And I don't have time to read the, uh, the, the letter that was written um, to Lord Rothschilds, but it basically says that His Majesty's government views with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national homeland for the Jewish people. They're determined to do it. And the British forces ultimately pushed. You see the, the use of that language. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Daniel chapter 11. Pushed the Turks out of the Holy Land according to Bible prophecy and, the follow, and following the war, Jews were at first able to return to the land as they desired. And thus Britain was first to assist the Jews to return to the land of Israel. And God gave them those nations that we mentioned as a price for their life. Now, friends, we're going to, at this point, look into the future. We're going to have a look at what at Britain's role that's going of, of events that are going to take place, and we're going to turn our attention, perhaps to, first of all, to uh, to um, well Britain's role in Armageddon, involvement in Armageddon, and the future work of Britain beyond Armageddon, because there's a very interesting work, and really we're going to, only going to scratch the surface on this, but. Indeed, friends, I think you're going to find it's incredibly interesting. And you're going to be absolutely, I was absolutely staggered when I first discovered some of these things at how precise the Bible is. So, first of all, we want to understand what this idea of Armageddon is. Well, Armageddon is used only once in the Bible. It's used in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16, where we're told he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. It comes from three Hebrew words. Armor, a heap of sheaves, or a heap, by implication, a heap of sheaves. Guy, a, a valley. Ju a don means judgment. So literally, we could say it's, it's talking about a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. We don't have time to go to those two references that we have at the bottom of the page. To, to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Armageddon, centred on Jerusalem. All nations are gathered against Jerusalem to battle. 
And into that, the Lord Jesus Christ and his immortal saints appear. Joel chapter 3, from verse 12 on. You've got multitudes, multitudes in the valley of threshing. It says valley of decision, but if you've got a margin like mine, you'll have a look. In the margin, it says threshing. It's a hint that here is Armageddon. And into that, the Lord Jesus Christ returns to save the people of Israel. And perhaps we'll summarise what Armageddon is about from Ezekiel chapter 38. Now we've read that in our reading. We don't propose to go through it in detail. We couldn't. When is it going to occur? Well, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 38 so we can just pick these points out. Um, I found it very useful in my study of this chapter to actually colour these things in. All right? When is it going to occur? Latter days. It's in the latter days. Have a look. It tells you that in verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter days. Thou, that is Russia or Rosh, shall come up into the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. That's interesting, isn't it? The mountains of Israel, not Palestine, Israel. Very interesting. Where are they going to come from? Verse 15. Out of the north. Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. That massive landmass up in the north. That's Russia. It's going to include Europe as well. How are they going to come? With a mighty army. We've got a show of force being described there in verse 14 and 15. Who's going to invade? Well, it's Russia from verse 2. We saw in the, if you uh, have uh, consult almost any other translation of the Bible, I did, a, I did a, an exercise once and there are, 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 are literally many, many translations of the Bible. That word chief in verse 2 is actually a proper noun, it's Rosh. And Gesenius tells us it's the most ancient form of Russia. Bokart tells us similar things. Who's it going to be opposed by? Well, verse 13, the Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and, and the young lions thereof. Who's going to control these events? God. God's in ultimate control. Verse 14, therefore, son of man, Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people dwell safely, shalt thou not know. He's telling them what's going to happen. God's in control. Russia can go so far and no further. Who's going to intervene? Well, we can see in verse 18, It shall come to pass at that time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord, My fury shall come up in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, have I spoken? Surely in that day there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And if we follow these things down, we'll see that ultimately God is going to be going to, to um, intervene and cause great destruction to that, that, that invading force. And we could go to Joel chapter 3 and, Ezekiel, and, and Zechariah chapter 14 and we could show you how that it's the Lord Jesus Christ and his immortal saints who will intervene. The, the saints will have previously been gathered to Mount Sinai to be judged and granted immortality. Now that's why I tell you, don't wait for Armageddon for, to do something about these things because the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth well before Armageddon. He's going to be revealed to his, those who are responsible to him, those who have had a, a sufficient understanding to be judged. He's going to be revealed to them first. And then it's in these events that he is going to appear to the world. The Lord Jesus Christ and the saints are going to appear in this, in this sphere, sphere to destroy the invading army. And the result, verse 23, God is honoured worldwide. Now, we can briefly have a look at this map, which is similar to one we've put up on other occasions and, and shows us that there's, we've got Goma, we've got Mago, we've got Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, we've got Tagama, we've got Persia, we've got Libya, we put Ethiopia down there, but in actual fact it probably should be this area here. Okay? So 
And they're going to be opposed by, well, Sheba and Dedan, the areas of, uh, of Arabia, and the merchants of Tarshish with the young lions thereof. Now, what would that be talking about? Well, thankfully, we have plenty of cartoons to tell us. You see, in World War I, when they were calling the allies of Britain, what symbols did they use? Well, the mother lion is calling the young lions. And you might be able to read it. It's Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and India. The Eastern Tarshish. We've got another one down here of, uh, oh, it's, it's again a World War I, um, a World War I um, um, poster. And once again, you've got New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, and there are others that are mentioned there. Australia's um, actually written here. Can't read it. Okay. So here is the merchants of Tarshish with the young lions thereof, the progeny of the old lion. And here's another one which is quite famous. All answer the call. Help by the young lions. The old lion defies his foes. Enlist now. And here they are Australia, Canada, India, and New Zealand. And so there's a list of countries which are the progeny of that old line of Britain who are going to, who are, who are the young lions who will be with Britain in that day to oppose Russia as he comes down upon the mountains of Israel. Now it's very interesting that he's to, we are told that it is the merchants of Tarshish. It's a trading name. It means to go about in trade. Now that's really interesting because that's exactly what Britain does and has for years. It was the British East India, India Company until it was disbanded in 1853. In actual fact, if you do some research on the Commonwealth of Nations, of which the Queen is the head, you will find that that is virtually a summary of the Commonwealth of Nations to go about in trade. There couldn't be a better word to describe them. In actual fact, we had Chogham here in, I think it was 2011. We did a little bit of research at that time and that's exactly what it's all about. It's all about trade. It's all about going about in trade and gathering wealth because that's where the, what they're interested in. So just, just to um, put ourselves in the picture, what's going to happen when these things occur? Well, judgment comes upon Russia because of their treatment of the land of Israel. It's going to involve earthquake. We saw these from verse 19 to 20. Confused warfare, verse 21. Call for a sword against him. Every man's sword will be against his fellow. Disease, pestilence and blood, verse 22. The elements, rain, fire, brimstone, hailstones. That's in verse 22. The result, complete destruction of Gog and his forces. We don't have time to go to Ezekiel chapter 39 and verses 2 to 5, but I'd suggest that you have a look at the other translations of that, those particular verses. The King James Version um, perhaps obscures things a little bit. The New American Standard Bible, the New King James Version, Rotherham and RSV talk about the complete destruction of Gog and his forces. But that's perhaps for next week's lecture. But what of Britain? Does Britain particularly obedient to God at the moment? I wouldn't say so. Is Britain obedient to the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ? I wouldn't say so. So there's judgment coming for them as well. In actual fact, when God destroys Russia, he's also going to judge Britain. In actual fact, we have two passages here, which we, uh, we could go to others, but we have two passages which show us of that first, they're going to be judged and humbled. What's the might of Britain? It's the ships. It's the, the maritime power of Britain. And Almighty God says in Isaiah chapter 2 and verses 12 to 17, we've only paraphrased that, we've taken a little bit out. 
He told that for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty. And wouldn't you say that the Western problem of the Western world of which Britain is a major part is pride, exaltation of self, and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. They're going to be humbled and it includes in amongst those things and upon all the ships of Tarshish. In actual fact, uh, Psalm 48, verse 6 and 7, talks about the ships being destroyed with an east wind. Not only are they going to be humbled, but they're going to be instructed in the things of God. And Isaiah chapter 66 and verses 16 to 19 talks about these things. When God says, and I will set a sign among them, He's talking about, actual, in actual fact, the Jews that have escaped the judgments that are going to take a place at that time. And God's going to turn them around and change them. And he will send them unto the nations to Tarshish, to Paul and to Lud, to draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles, among the nations. And the Gentiles, including Tarshish, are going to be instructed in the things of God. Now, friends, I want to come, you come I want you to come with me to Isaiah chapter 18. Because in Isaiah chapter 18, we have a very obscure prophecy. In actual fact, many Many expositors of the word of God are totally confused about what this, this chapter is actually talking about. I'm going to tell you that, amongst other things, it tells us of Britain's role. And a careful consultation of the Hebrew will, be, will show us that this is, in fact, extremely, extremely clear. So we're told in verse 1, Woe to the land overshadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Now, we could have a look. That's the word Cush again. And so here we've got a land who's, who has wings that overshadow the world beyond Ethiopia. And it's a description, friends, of the, the overshadowing power of the British Empire. It's a description of how that empire was a maritime power, and we'll see that in a moment, how that's actually talking about a maritime power who, whose, whose influence spread beyond the rivers of Kush, the rivers of Ethiopia, the Tigris and the Euphrates, India, Canada, Australia, and all those countries that, that Britain controlled. We, there's a huge list of them, we know, that they control, which were beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And it says in verse 2 that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers unto a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land rivers have spoiled. That's the nation of Israel. Go to the Jews that are scattered. In these vessels of bulrushes. And let's just come down to verse 7. And it says this. What are they going to do with these people that are scattered? Well, in verse 7, in that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and peeled. From a people terrible from their beginning hitherto. It's the same people, isn't it? Of verse 2. A nation meted out and trodden underfoot. Description of the Jews. Whose land the rivers have spoiled. You know, um, Assyria overflowed unto the neck of the land of Israel. It's like a river, isn't it? The Euphrates Empire was dried up. It overflowed the land of Israel. It's the land that rivers have spoiled, as in empires have spoiled. To a place, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. 
So where they're being brought, from all the nations of the world where they've been scattered, they're going to be brought back as a present to Almighty God, to the Lord Jesus Christ ruling in Mount Zion. Now that's the work that this maritime power is going to do. Now what are they going to use? Well, verse 2 is no wonder that the original translations and their translators had no idea what it was all about. Because firstly, they thought it was all about Ethiopia. Secondly, they didn't actually, the things that are being spoken of didn't exist in 1611. They didn't even exist in the times of Isaiah. And what Isaiah saw, he had to describe. What did he see? Well, we're going to concentrate our attention on verse 2. That sendeth ambassadors by the sea in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that in actual fact, a literal translation is this, which sendeth by sea whirling things upon vessels of fleetness on the surface of waters. Now let's just have a look at two words that are used in this verse. The word ambassadors in the King James Version in verse 2. You know what an ambassador does? An ambassador goes around the world, or in the times of Isaiah, he would go around the world on a ship. In actual fact, if you consult the Hebrew, it actually has some, it means doesn't mean something that goes round the world on a ship. It means something that goes round and round on a ship. Perhaps we could say a propeller. You see why he uses sea whirling things? Here's ships that have got propellers that are going to go with fleetness. Because when Isaiah saw this, he couldn't believe how fast the ships went. So he described it as vessels of bulrushes. Well, that's what the King James Version has. It's actually placed as a noun by the Masoretes without authority. It's not a noun. It's a descriptive word. Rather, it's a descriptive word. And as a bulrush rapidly draws up water, you put it in the water, it rapidly draws up water, so these vessels will rapidly make their way through the water. Using what? Sea whirling things. Propellers. You see how exactly accurate the scriptures can be? You see how accurate God was in describing things that didn't even exist at that time. And he says, this nation, in the future, when the Lord Jesus Christ is king in Mount Zion, as we see in verse 7, they are going to gather the people, the Jews from the nations of the world, and bring them back to the land of Israel as a present to Almighty God in Jerusalem. So that's the work that Britain has in the future. They will oppose Russia. They will be judged. But they will be used by Almighty God for his work of bringing the Jews, all of the Jews back to the land of Israel. So let's summarise our, our, the things we have considered this evening. In the past, the course that, Britain, that the British lion and her young lions have taken has in fact been accurately fulfilled in Bible prophecy. Their future is mapped out in the Bible. They will oppose Russia when she invades the Middle East. And Just by the way, does Britain look comfortable in the European Union? The Bible says they won't. And here we know, here we know why. Ezekiel 38, they're going to oppose Europe and Russia. After Christ has returned, has destroyed the Russian invader, he will require the Commonwealth nations, Britain and his young lions, to submit to him along with the other nations of the world. They'll be humble and educated, and given an opportunity to respond. Britain and many of her allies will give allegiance to Christ and will place their resources at his disposal. Friends, we have an opportunity as we look at these things to be with the Lord Jesus Christ when he rules this earth. We owe it to ourselves to use prophecy for what it was determined for. 
to warn us of things not seen as yet and to, rem to move with fear to take the necessary steps for the saving of ourselves and of our families.